Hi guys, and in today's video, I'm going to talk about the massively big subject of reads. Very important to all sax players, I'm sure you'll agree. Now, I'd like to kind of subdivide this introduction and discussion into reads into about sort of five or six parts. And first of all, I'm going to deal with a couple of myths, and I'm going to hopefully bust those myths. Um, so the first myth being that the strength of reed is a measure of the thickness of the cane. Uh, this was something that I believed um, until several years ago when I was actually corrected on the matter. So the strength of reed, the numbering system that you see on the back of the reed, is not about the actual thickness and gauge of the reed. It's actually a measure of resistance. So to give you an example, if we take Rico reeds, so if you take a Rico 1.5 strength, it's actually the same strength as a Rico uh, 5, believe it or not, or a 3.5. It's just simply that the higher number um, has much stiffer cane and is therefore much more resistant to the breath pressure. And that's why we select a different number because of the resistance system. So in practical terms, that uh, harder reed with the higher number um, is going to withstand a much stronger current of air. Uh, another way of looking at it is that imagine you've got a scale of uh, resistance from here to here with, say, a strength one and a half. Well, if you put, apply that same scale to, say, a strength three and a half, it's going to start about there in terms of breath pressure and end about there. There's going to be this crossover where the same given amount of air pressure will produce results. But for that harder airflow somewhere in this middle area, you're going to produce um, a quieter sound on that harder reed with more of a sort of fluffiness to it, and you'll be more maxing out with that same given air pressure on a softer reed. Um, so that's how the scale of strengths work. So the second myth that I'd like to bust is that the strength of the reed is a measure of the player's ability, which again is not true. So just because you've raced through the strengths when you start out, so you start at one and a half, then you progress to two, et cetera, et cetera, and eventually you end up on a, you know, three and a half, four after quite a short period of time, that doesn't suddenly mean that you are the world's best saxophone player. Uh, you might feel like that inside yourself because there's this sort of feeling of progression as you go through the strengths. Um, in fact, my own personal journey was sort of something similar to that in that uh, I started playing the sax when I was at school and I started on strength one and a half and it was probably within two years that I was at strength five Rico Royal against my teacher's advice and uh, here, here we are several years later and now I'm settling on something like a three soft or a three medium strength um, and I think we all feel this, this sort of urgency to kind of produce the, the biggest, fullest, darkest sound if you like, and the feeling that this is going to come from a really hard read. Well, I'm not saying don't go for hard reads. They do work for some people in certain contexts. Um, but I would say for most of you, my advice would be progress through the various different strengths and eventually settle on something that's somewhere midway up the scale that's going to give you a nice balance of everything. So a medium resistance uh, read's going to give you control over the quiet side of things, whilst also having enough sort of stiffness and resistance in the cane to be able to knock it out and give some real punch to the sound. Um, you need a flexible reed, something that's going to give you like a wide tonal palette, and that's something that I've just personally discovered uh, that works for myself. I think it's always very important to consider when we're playing the saxophone that you have a setup that doesn't get in the way of playing music and, and producing just nice musical phrases. You don't want to be fighting with the, the thing that's in front of you. And for me, uh, personally, there can be a danger that if you have a very hard read, that you're kind of fighting a bit, fighting the read a little bit, and you're actually almost sort of gripping onto the read and just, just sticking in a little bit in order to produce the sound. And sure, you can produce a nice, heavy, attacking, loud sound. But the moment you try and sort of back off, the tone can disappear a little bit. So you can feel like you're sort of trying to chase the sound rather than just relaxing and getting on with the music. And I always feel that with a, a medium resistant reed, you can focus on producing a good open technique, which is to say an open throat, a more relaxed embouchure, in order to produce the nice sort of colors and natural sound quality within the reed rather than trying to fight against it. So that's my own sort of personal 
journey and that's what works for me. I'm sure that works for a lot of you as well. Now I'm going to move on to the hot topic of consistency, um, often debated and discussed and questions are asked of us as staff here at sex.co of which are the most consistent reads. I'm really struggling with brand X and can you advise another brand that's going to give me more consistency? And it's always a difficult conversation because there's no single answer of, oh yes, those reads are just simply inconsistent, you need to try these. You're going to find that all the main manufacturers are, are going to claim that their reads are the most consistent. And it's certainly true that over you know, recent decades, um, the production methods and the harvesting and everything that goes on with producing uh, natural cane reeds has severely improved to the point where there's much better consistency out there, but there's still going to be variation from brand to brand. Um, and I suppose there's a consideration of what's the most important thing to the player. Is it that absolute uh, pure quality of sound that you're after? Or is it just having a really consistent read? And some people go for one school of thought and uh, others go for another school. But um, ideally, of course, we would have a situation where you're getting great sounding reads and you can pretty much rely on the idea that they're all going to be consistent. Uh, it's not necessarily always uh, the practical truth of the matter. Um, but there's some practical things that we can actually do. Uh, we can perhaps take a, a little bit more of a philosophical approach with all this and accept that within our box of 10 reads, we're just going to have bad reads and what to do with those bad reads. Um, and over recent years, my own personal methods are to take those bad reads, not just bin them outright, uh, but to actually put them aside and mark them as such. Um, so I use this little traffic light system. Um, I've got green, I just put a little highlight uh, pen on, on, onto the read. A little green mark for this is a performance ready read and I know that this is good, I can just relax, get on with it, the read's going to be fine. And then there's that sort of popular middle ground area where, okay, I'm quite convinced about the read, it's definitely got potential, but I'm going to mark it orange or amber, so it sort of goes in that, that middle category. And then you've just got those reads where you pick them out of the packet and straight away you just can't even get going on it. It feels sort of fluffy or, or really thin and edgy and you just think, this is a bad read, so it gets marked red. Um, but I don't throw those reads away, they can still have a use. You've got to bear in mind that a read's characteristic can vary quite a bit from that moment it comes out the box gets its first airing to, to maybe a couple of weeks later when it's had three or four tries and then you're actually thinking, well, it still works, I can use this read. Perhaps it's not going to be a sort of concept performance read, but I can still practice with it. So you shouldn't really waste any reads unless they are just so obviously duffers. You can find a use uh, for all reads and that's something that I've tried to accept into my sort of general practices o over recent years. So the next topic for discussion is this issue of filed reads versus unfiled reads. So first of all, what does that mean? So I have two examples of baritone reads here. One is filed and one's unfiled. First of all, the filed read. What we've got here is we've got the standard scrape on the top half, and then we've got the bark section at the bottom. And then just in between the two of them, we've got this sort of intermediate section of slightly scraped cane. And then on the unfiled read, it's exactly the same, only there's sort of like two basic sections, if you like. So the, the cane section at the top, which is scraped, and then the shiny bark bit at the bottom, um, which goes all the way up to the back of the scrape. Um, now, it's just a small little subtle thing that you see there, um, but it can have a reasonably significant effect on the response and the articulation for the sax player. By removing a little bit more cane at the back of the scrape, it gives the, the player a little bit more um, brightness, ability to articulate more cleanly overall. Um, the, the overall characteristics and the fundamentals of the reed are still the same, so it still feels very similar when you swap from an unfiled to a filed. But there's just that little subtle response thing and a little bit more of a sort of lifting of those um, kind of brightness frequencies, if you like. Um, so it's a great idea that manufacturers can offer this. They don't all offer it, but, but some of them do. They offer a filed version and an unfiled version. And it can just give you that little difference that suits the kind of music or the sort of sound that you're wanting to produce. 
Um, in terms of trying to find out whether unfiled is for you or filed is for you, I would recommend that you try more than just an individual read. Again, it's that whole thing of consistency, the fact that we're dealing with um, organic substance here. If you try a single unfiled and then you try a single filed read and then you hear a difference, it's not necessarily that the difference that you're hearing immediately on that example is filed versus unfiled. It could be the difference in the, the quality of the cane. In other words, there's two variables. You're, you're probably better off trying three or four or even a whole box of one type and then a box of another. It's just a more scientific uh, way of exploring that kind of thing. I'd now like to talk about the importance of the reed strength within the setup. Now by the setup, what I mean is the reed, the mouthpiece and the ligature, the three things that comprise the setup. Now so much about your choice of reed is dependent upon the context, so the mouthpiece, uh, the ligature less crucially so, but more importantly the mouthpiece. So people would often come to me, for example, and ask me, should I be playing on a stronger reed? And if they give me no more information at that stage, I simply just cannot answer that question. I need to know so many more things, such as the mouthpiece that they're using, the style of music they're trying to get into, how long they've been playing, etc., etc. And then even within the mouthpiece, there's some really important things like the tip opening and the facing. All these things can dramatically affect the, the setup. There are so many little variables here. But there's a general tendency in the sax community for um, a classical setup to involve a harder reed um, with a closer tipped mouthpiece and then in the jazz side of things a slightly more open mouthpiece with a slightly softer reed. Uh, just taking the classical setup to start with, um, let's say you're using a Selma C star or C double star with a harder reed like say a Van Doren three and a half, that's a fairly typical classical setup and what that does is it gives the player that sort of concise control, that sort of slightly more focused dark sound and a real control over that quiet end of things where you can very clearly hear that clean articulation on the quieter side. Now if you give that uh, classical player with that setup a wider mouthpiece, so keep the same read, that Van Doren 3.5 and, and you then give that classical player say a Selma S80F that classical player would really struggle at that stage trying to produce the sound that he or she is used to. When it comes to controlling the quieter end of things, the sound would almost disappear or it would become a bit lazy and fuzzy, you wouldn't get that clean articulation. It's almost like you can only go for one thing, you can go for the, the hard read but a, a softer, or sorry, not a softer but a smaller tip opening or the other way around, a wider tip opening and a slightly softer read. There are some players out there who can manage both and they've just got you know, whacking lung ability and they can really put the air out there. But you tend to find those players who use a very big, strong read and a wide tip opening. Um, they produce a very big sound and when you ask them to back off a little bit, the sound kind of peters out to an extent. So just to pick up from that last point, going on to the jazz setup, that more typical setup is the, the wider tip opening and a sort of more medium strength read, that can work very well for sort of all round styles of playing. You could take that to extremes as well by having a much wider tip opening, you know, say nine, nine star, and a softer read. The tendency when you balance it that way is that the sound can be much more sort of leery, very punchy, very free blowing, but very loud. As soon as you start to really push it, it can get a little bit um, sort of in my book a little bit sort of flappy sounding, you can control that, but that's the tendency it pushes in. So again with all of this discussion it's about balances and for the sort of average jazz player, let's take a tenor example, um, say a seven star is a very typical tip opening along with something like a three, three and a half kind of strength read and that gives you a nice sort of overall balance of sound. And within the context of the jazz sound, compared to the classical sound I described back there with that dark sort of focus sound and the emphasis on the quieter side, and more of the jazz side, you're going to get this um, very big sound with a lot more sort of overtones, and sort of more brightness on the top, but still that bass area underneath. And when the jazz player then plays a bit quieter, you tend to get that sort of more fluffiness in there, which is a bit more desirable within the context of a jazz sound. But that's how you can largely differentiate the sort of the two schools of playing, if you like. 
So now I'd like to talk about the idea of clipping or scraping your reeds. Now the irony about this subject for me is that I personally come from an oboe playing background and I got heavily into reed making when I was at college or even before I was at college and I just spent hours manipulating and actually making my reeds from scratch I should say really. And I had all the gear, so cane splitters, uh, gouging machines, shaping machines and I actually got quite good at it and sort of obsessed by it but it was still a massive frustration for me because even though I'd spend hours doing this and I would make what would seem like the perfect read in terms of all the measurements and all the precision being there, um, I would just find huge variation from read to read. And again, that touches on something that I've spoken about before, this natural variation that, that you get within you know, the organic matter of natural read cane. And there's nothing you can do about that barring, uh, well, in ter oboe terms there, buying you know, really good reed cane that in theory is really consistent. Um, but what it's uh, allowed me to learn as a sax player is that you can take a reed, you can hold a reed up to the light, which is something I'd encourage you to do, just to study um, the various different parts of the reed. Look at, uh, you can break it down into you know, the heart, um, the tip, all sorts of bits and pieces on the scrape of the reed and you can learn about how it's produced and you can see where there might be some areas uh, where you might want to manipulate it in order to proof, uh, improve its performance a little bit. So, but first of all I'd like to say that, believe me, compared to the life of an oboist, as sax players, we really do have it easy. We're only dealing with one flat bit of cane, we're not dealing with two bits of cane that are um, bound together and, and curved and for me it was sort of such a nightmare at the time and it, it's much easier being a sax player. But on saying that we still do have our issues which is precisely why we're making these videos right now. So first of all let me just discuss um, this business of clipping your reeds. So you can use a thing called a reed clipper. Uh, what it basically does is it takes the, the very tip of the, the reed away. You can take away half a millimetre, a millimetre or even more, it's entirely up to you. But the thing that you should be aware of when you're doing this, this is just like my warning that comes with it, is that by removing a sliver of cane on the tip of the reed, you're actually changing the whole balance of the scrape. If you like, all the bits that come before the tip are all being moved along a little bit as we take off the end. Now, why would we take off the end? If you feel that you've been playing on a reed and it's, it's starting to sound a bit whiny, maybe a little bit thin, um, then this might be a reason why you just take off the tip because it just gives it a little bit more resistance again and brings it back to life. Um, but you can't just keep doing this, you can't just keep clipping down and clipping down because you remove the very bit that's producing all that articulation and the, the sort of front of the sound. So you've got to know when to stop and you've got to know what you're doing with that kind of thing. Uh, but it's, it's worth thinking about if you just want to get maybe a little bit more life out of your reeds or even if you put on a brand new reed and you just find it's just a little bit too buzzy that might be the solution, just taking off the tip. The second thing to discuss is actually manipulating the cane on the reed itself and there's various things you can do there um, by scraping the cane or sanding it. In fact there's a wonderful little device called a reed geek, I've got one here this is a sort of uh, high precision tool uh, made from you know a really dense solid material and basically what it does is scrapes the reed so you can go above and beyond what the manufacturer has already done to manipulate it and just bring it into the perfect balance um, you know deal with areas of concern where you're not perhaps getting the, the, you know, the full response and vibration that you're expecting Again, it's an art, just like playing the sax. You need to learn how to use one of these things. It's not just a case of taking a reed, finding that it feels uh, stuffy or resistant or something like that, for example, and then just scraping away at it. If you just do that randomly, you'll probably make the reed even worse. So you need to really understand the anatomy of the reed. Um, and going back to my um, experience as, as an oboe player and, and reed maker back in the day, um, I used to spend hours doing this kind of thing and just to give you a couple of tips there um, the first thing to do um, when we're adjusting a reed and we're scraping it is to work with the cane we don't want to be gouging into it and compressing fibers and, and creating little scoops the idea of the, the scrape on all reeds is that it generally peters down 
from the back of the scrape all the way to the tip and there's this nice sort of gradation. Of course the, the cuts do vary from reed to reed and, and that's uh, what we're going to get into in future videos. Um, but the idea is that it's still this general gradation all the way down. And if you just take one of these things and just sort of you know, remove cane willy-nilly with all these sort of scoops and gouges, you're just going to make it worse. That's my little tip on using something like this. But a very useful device if you're trying to get a little bit more uh, consistency out of a box of five or ten reeds and trying to sort of turn those, you know, number five, number six reeds into number eights and that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, a lovely bit of kit, this one. Another thing that comes up a lot is this business of soaking your reeds, soaking or not to soak, as the question might be. Um, in my personal opinion, I don't think this subject is as important as some of the other things I've been talking about, but it does come up a lot, so perhaps I'll just say a few things about it. Um, I would say that overall, if you were to take a brand new reed out of its packet and play it, and then if you were to do the same thing, um, but prior to playing it you'd, you were going to soak it, there will be a little bit of a difference in the way it performs, but ultimately a reed is still going to show its true colours regardless of whether you soak it or not. Um, so that, that's the sort of main thing to bear in mind. You're still dealing with the same bit of cane. Um, the soaking is just a way of getting that reed going and perhaps uh, caring for it in a slightly different way. Um, you might say that it's a good practice to soak brand new reeds straight out the package, and that's certainly something that I would do. Um, a reed, when it is in its foil or in its little plastic container that comes out the box, um, has dried out a long way um, since the manufacturing process. And when we start playing on it, uh, day one, it's going to start getting get very wet in our mouth, and then day two, it's still going to retain a lot of that moisture. But a way of getting it going is to soak it. I mean, traditionally, you can just use water. It's very pure um, compared to the, the thick saliva in our mouth but an old school, school method of, of getting a reed going is just to actually lick the reed and that will be better than doing nothing and just putting it straight into your mouth. Um, so it's a good practice to soak the reeds in, in water. Some people use warm water, some people go for cold water. You might just fill up a little tub and, and soak it um, halfway up the length of the reed if you like. Um, actually, in my research for this video, um, I have found out some useful little bits of information from some of the manufacturers such as Alexander Superior Reeds, where they actually say that with a, a brand new reed what you should do is soak it in water for, I can't remember, perhaps it was five minutes, but they suggest warm water, and then you play the reed just softly for 15 minutes, a sort of mezzo-piano uh, dynamic. And then you don't do anything further, you just simply put the reed away and then the next day you get it out and you start to play it properly and that's a better way of bedding the reed in, as it were, rather than just going sort of straight in hell for leather, you know, play it hard straight out of the package. So that, that's something I'm going to personally experiment with um, in, into the future. But I should say there's a few devices out there and techniques that we can use to help sort of further the life of our reeds and care for the reeds as we're going along. Um, so one of the things is a product called Rejuvenate, which is something that we stock. Um, it looks like this. It's a little plastic container. As I unscrew it, you can see inside that there's um, a slot for three individual reeds. And the idea is it's more than just a reed case. There's a sort of central section uh, of sponge material, and the idea is that you soak that sponge in Listerine, which is diluted, I believe, and it's just going to allow your, your reeds to last a, a little bit longer. It's putting your reeds into a controlled, um, sort of alcoholic environment. Um, of course, reeds made, uh, being made from a sort of natural organic substance um, are breaking down all the time when you add saliva to them. So um, this is what we're always up against as sax players, the fact that a reed has a certain lifespan and we're trying to always elongate that lifespan and this is a, a technique that you can use to, in order to do that. So worth experimenting with uh, this little device and see if it works for you. Um, another little thing I've got to show you here is something the Dario make. Um, it's on the surface just um, a regular reed case, rather nice looking reed case. Um, I'm going to open it up and just show you. There we go. And you've got four reeds on the front and four on the back. So that operates nicely as a reed case. But within this, you insert this uh, little reed vitalizer. It's like a two-way humidity control pack, they call it. 
And what that does is it just regulates um, the environment within which the reed is stored. So you've always got this humidity, this humid environment that the reed is stored in, so it's not drying out and warping and then getting wet again. It's this constantly controlled environment. And again, it's another discussion uh, point. Should we be storing our reeds in a sort of constantly wet environment, or should you perhaps dry it out and then re-soak it every time? Um, but for a lot of players, this kind of technique does work if you just want that sort of consistent response from a reed. As soon as you get it out the packet, it, it, it goes straight away, rather like synthetic reeds. So, and, and I think particularly also if you're on the road, if you're a sax player that's touring and you just want to have some reliability and uh, consistency as you're going along, this kind of setup can really do the trick. I've now just got a few wrap-up thoughts on how to organise our reeds, if you like. Um, it's very easy as sax players just to have reeds lying about everywhere. I think this one's good, this one's bad, it's got this particular mark on it. You open your saxophone case and there's sort of reeds lying around all over the place and you're trying to remember which one's the performance one and then you get it wrong and it, you know, it sounds horrible. All that kind of thing. Um, so just a little bit of organisation can help you have a more sort of effective um, lifestyle as a sax player, if you like. Um, so back to something I mentioned earlier, I've got this traffic light system of the, you know, the green, the amber and, and the red and all the rest of it. That helps me organise my reeds a little bit. But also if we bring reed cases into the mix whereby we establish our good reeds, and we mark it thus and, and you place it in that, that reed case, perhaps at mark number one if you have a reed case that has a numbering system. You know that's your good reed, you leave it alone and then you practice on the slightly worse reeds. So that's a good overall sort of organisational technique. Uh, but secondly, it's maybe an idea to think about rotating your reeds where you have your performance reed and then you try and find another performance read. So rather than just relying on that performance read for all your performances until it dies, um, it's going to again have this sort of natural curve, this lifespan. Well, why not develop another read of sort of similar quality um, and have that sitting alongside it? And then you've got two to choose from that you can rotate. And then in the background, you've still always got your bad reads that you're sort of practicing on. So it's just thinking about this kind of thing and developing a system that works and keeps you nice and organized. So that kind of wraps up my general discussion on reeds. I've mentioned a lot there. Um, no playing as, as such at the moment, but I'm now about to do some playing in the next few videos, the next part or parts in this series. Um, so in the next video to come, I'm going to be looking at Didario reeds. And I'm going to go through all the individual cuts there and do a little playing demonstration on each cut and just discussing my sort of immediate feelings after I've played each one, just discuss what I feel each cut is giving me. And I'm going to do exactly the same for all the Van Doren reads and then I'm going to look at all the other brands in a final video. So I hope you've enjoyed this sort of read setup and discussion as it were. Sorry it's gone on for a long time but I'm sure you can appreciate there's a lot to discuss. Thanks.